Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Welcome to Iron TV's new show, Being Muslim, hosted by me, Oli Noor. On Being Muslim, every week we have special guests from different professional and academic backgrounds to speak about the relevant topic. Today, alhamdulillah, we have with us Dr. Sultan Habib, a doctor and psychiatrist who will be joining with uh, us and from uh, in in the in the studio, and uh, he'll be talking about uh, m mental health and uh, Muslims. So, welcome to the show, uh, Dr. Sultan. Assalamu alaikum wa alaikum salam wa Thank you for having me. So, uh, how are you doing um, today in in today's COVID uh, scenario? Uh, alhamdulillah. Um, just it's, it's, today I'm currently self isolating because a uh, uh, relative got tested positive for coronavirus. Mm. So our house is being kept in isolated, inshallah. But it's, it's all right, everyone's okay. Um, yeah, that's really okay. Just, just a little correction. Um, yeah. So my name is Dr. Sultan Hatab. I'm currently a psychiatry foundation fellow. Um, so not quite a psychiatrist as of yet. So I'm just very still junior in my training. But alhamdulillah, I'm on that pathway. Soon to be psychiatrist, inshallah. Inshallah, so, let's see how things go. So, um, the first question uh, for our audience today: What is uh, psychiatry? We we sp said this word a couple of times already now. Mm. Yes. So, psychiatry is a medical profession, uh, which essentially deals with sort of the medical aspect of treating mental health illnesses. Mm. So. Um, to become a psychiatrist, you have to be a medical doctor. So you have to go through medical school. You have to do all the training, all the foundation training, do all your rotations, other stuff before you do a speciality training um, in psychiatry. I'm currently still doing my foundation training, um, which is a, but it's a special program designed to try and get people to quickly get into psychiatry. Um, so for, for many people, you have to go through that pathway to be a proper doctor and then specialize into psychiatry, which is a medical profession, it's a medical field. Um, so the way that psychiatry works is that it's a combination of understanding mental illnesses from an organic and inorganic pathway. So if it's a mm. physical problem, if there's like a, a problem that's caused in the, on the body itself that causes the mental illness, or if it's just within the mind, you can treat it uh, using various medications and uh, interventions with other professionals to try and um, uh, to try and sort of help the patient get as well as possible. Okay. One thing you mentioned there, organic and in, inorganic pathways. Uh, what do you mean yeah. by that exactly? So often when some people have their first episodes of like mental illnesses, so mental illness is split into various categories. You have your mood disorders, you have your psychotic symptoms, you have your personality issues, and um, some and, and, and other stuff like autisms, etc. Um, and organic um, causes is stuff like maybe like a something that's happened physically in the brain. So let's say if there's like a tumor, or if there's like a hormones that are being crazily like was released, mm. or if something else is happening, uh, which we can identify, we can treat that, and that usually treats the cause. But if they don't have any sort of organic cause, then there's other ways to sort of treat somebody. Um, in, in, in that aspect, so the inorganic aspect, if you may. Okay. So you trained as a medical doctor. What led you to want, what what made you pursue the path of psychiatry? Um, so when I first uh, when I first joined medicine, mm. um, I didn't really have any much respect for the profession because, as many, I, I was sort of succumbed by the stigma attached to it. People thought that they're not really doctors, they're just wasting their time, it's just X, Y, Z. And the reality is, mm. the reason why that's, that became the case is because um, psychiatry hasn't had the same funding as other, other specialties because for some reason it's not valued. I think most people are just afraid of it. So okay. what I did is that I had my own sort of, uh, in my family I have some issues with mental illness. Um, myself, I had some issues myself pertaining to my mental well-being and sort of issues there. And as a result, in 2014, we, um, a few of us decided to create an organization within our university mm. to try and help people to uh, manage the issues that they're facing on a daily basis. Because let's be honest, three, four, five, six years of university is a very long time. And anything can happen. Yeah. So when, I, when we started creating a project to deal with the welfare of the people there, um, and this was at King's College London, by the way. Um, 
I realized just about the, the, the severity of, the, of, of how mental illness is, is like rife within our community. Mm. And most of it is to do with like social factors. So what's happening in the home, their workplace scenarios, um, you know, relationships, attachments, upbringing, etc. So for me, the reason why I walked into it is because I was working in that field already since 2014. Mm. I went on to do some uh, work with some uh, with, with organizations, and then I went on to create my own project. And um, because of that, it made sense to sort of pursue this in, in, in an academic pathway such that I could help as many people as possible um, within my own community. Okay, mashallah, that sounds like a very uh, noble intentions there. And as I understand it, the project that you've ended up uh, uh, starting is called the Afia project. Yeah. That's correct. That's correct, yeah. It's the Afia project. We started in 2018. It's a, it's a group of uh, purely volunteers mm. who are just trying to do as much psychoeducation as possible. Okay, mashallah. Uh, hopefully we'll get a chance to talk about that in the second half of the uh, interview. So, um, you mentioned that uh, the funding uh, is, is not there in psychiatry and I think I've been seeing maybe myself uh, not, uh, that uh, within the mental health field um, it's becoming a little bit more uh, common, uh, it's becoming a, a little bit more understood in more recent years and I was wondering if you can give a brief intro introduction to mental health within the Western uh, development. Okay, so mental health. So what is mental health? Mm. It's, if you look at the WHO's definition, it's mm. essentially um, when somebody has... The definition of health as a whole is mm. a full state of general physical, mental, and if so, spiritual well-being. Now, mental health is your ability for your mind to function uh, normally without sort of interruption essentially so if you're able to function on a day-to-day -day basis from a, from, a, from a mental perspective not necessarily physical mm. although it can contribute so mental health is like I said it's, it's con you, you have your mood disorders your psychotic yeah. symptoms your personality disorders and you have other issues as well that are like rarer and then you have all the stuff that people are not that aware of such as autism mm. uh, dementia Alzheimer's etc all of that falls under uh, mental health as well. It's, a, it's an umbrella term. Now, think of mental health as like your physical health. You know, what, what, if, I was, if you were to ask me, you know, Dr. Hattab, could you um, define physical health? It's, mm. it's, it's very difficult to because it's, it's quite large. So similarly with mental health, it's very extensive. Now, uh, from a Western perspective, um, if somebody was to present with a group of symptoms or some like, um, or some sort of disturbances in their mind, then uh, you'll be able to categorize them into an illness, but it's not the illness itself that's going to affect them, it's the symptoms, isn't it? Yeah. So some people, when they have a mental illness, so let's say a mood disorder, you can have a high mood disorder or a low mood disorder. Most people fall into the low category, where they feel very low, they don't have energy, they're very tired all the time, they, uh, they don't remember the last time they enjoyed something, mm. you know, they're not able to sort of interact, they don't want to, they might have issues with their relationships. That's, a, that's more like a depressive types of symptoms. And then you have the opposite, where they're very, they have a lot of energy, they're, they're, they're very friendly, they try to go from one thing to another to another very quickly, they're not sleeping very well, um, they might not eat properly, they might be a bit irritable. And that's called the opposite, that's like a manic or hypomanic episode. Um, and those are mood disorders. Mm -hmm. So you have, we have medications that can stabilize them. So you have your antidepressants, you have your mood stabilizers. Unfortunately, as with every medication, there are some side effects, but yeah. people are adequately treated mm. to make sure that they're able to function with as minimal side effects as possible. And even those side effects, we can treat as well. Huh. So uh, we, we have, so in terms of mental health, that's, that's from a mood disorder. Then mm -hmm. we have the stuff that people don't really understand, which is more like the psychotic symptoms. So this is where you have people that have, that have hallucinations, where they may hear something that isn't there, see something that isn't there, feel something that isn't there, mm. you know, smell something, taste something that isn't there. Essentially, what is happening is that their brain is misfiring and it's sending them signals. Mm. Now, some people, they may very much understand that, okay, they've got an issue which they have to deal with, um, whereas others um, may not have that insight. So that's a hallucination. You may get delusions, which is like very, very strong be fixed beliefs mm. that no matter how much evidence you show to them about the contrary, they will still believe it. 
Um, so you have hallucinations, delusions, then there's the paranoia. People get very paranoid, fearful, you know, the phobias, mm. not being able to leave the house, maybe holding, and you have the personality disorders, and then you have like things like obsessive compulsive disorder, mm. which is very debilitating, you know, the scrupulosity. Loads of things exist, loads of illnesses exist, and from a Western mental health perspective, um, there's adequate treatment for most of them, and things are going to, be, uh, things are progressing very quickly. So as you mentioned, in terms of funding, uh, I think, uh, I don't know if I mentioned, but we're about 50 years behind everyone else, or so, before, behind every other speciality in terms of our development. Wow. Uh, but we're catching up very quickly, and that's mainly to do with the fact that the, uh, the sort of, the funding that's coming from external people mm. is not as much. So, for example, people will, di will, will give funding towards cancer research, towards HIV research, towards dementia and Alzheimer's because they feel very, uh, they feel very passionate towards it. But yeah. for some, but mm. it may not be the same for mental health. But I think within the next few years or so, we'll understand like diseases, illnesses like schizophrenia, just mm. like we understand heart failure. We do understand it to a lot. We understand how these work, and we do manage to make people better and function well in society. But the issue is obviously, uh, you know, it's just people are essentially afraid to engage with us, and as a result, aren't really doing much, doing favors for themselves. Mm. So, so it sounds like a field that is still. Uh, developing uh, greatly and um, you mentioned earlier that uh, there are uh, broadly uh, to, to categorize it that there's a uh, mood uh, swings or, or such and uh, psychotic behavior which fall under mental health and with both it, from, from your description it sounds like there's uh, low level and high level and so it seems like it's not a simple yes or no I have a mental health issue I don't it, so it sounds a bit more complex than that Yes, yes. So here's the thing. Mm. It's, you can have a group of symptoms. So if you, if you feel unwell, you can say, I feel low, I feel anxious, I feel this. Mm. But that doesn't necessarily mean that you have a mental illness. Now, what people tend to un misunderstand is that uh, people confuse. So for, say, for example, the most commonly confused illness is depression. And most people think that depression means that you have, that if you're sad, mm. then it's bad, or if you're constantly sad or whatever. It's more than that, um, because let's, I'm going to be very honest with you, mm. being sad, transient sadness is healthy, because that's how you develop, that's how you grow, that's mm. how you experience the, the human sort of experience. Mm. So when you have people that are misunderstanding illnesses by saying, oh, I have this symptom, this symptom, this symptom, and then self-diagnosing, and then telling other people that you may have this, you may have that, mm. without being coming from a doctor, mm. then naturally, that will cause more issues because I'll be very honest with you. Most people that have symptoms where it looks, where it may look like to other people that they have mental illness, may not actually be mentally ill. Oh. And uh, if if and this is where the danger lies. You see mm -hmm. what I mean? So it's important to get a diagnosis from a doctor to make sure that absolutely okay. Mm. Absolutely, I think for everyone needs to. If you feel that there's somebody mm. that may have an illness, please take them to their general practitioner who may or may not then refer them on to a psychiatrist and then they will be ref they'll be examined properly and mm. then we'll, we'll see if there's a treatment plan needed for them but mm. you know it's very important that you must in you must involve the uh, the, the appropriate authorities mm. when you're sort of taking part in this okay and when you, when it comes to treatment to mental health issues as i understand it broadly speaking there's uh, two types of treatments the medicinal route and uh, talking therapies um, this is just from my understanding and uh, as a psychiatrist um, you is it that you encompass both routes or uh, how does it work so, just, again, just to reiterate, I'm still a foundation doctor. Oh, sorry, um, uh, yes. It's fine, sorry, it's fine. As, as a trainee psychiatrist. Um, so, so when it comes yeah. to um, treatment, so there, there is the medicinal one where you give yeah. the medications. Uh, that will help dampen the symptoms so mm -hmm. they're not as affected by it. But then um, you still need to deal with the, the cause of the problem. Okay. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. So... Uh, the, the talking therapy will help deal in, delve into the root of the problem and allow them to process things. Mm. That's another. That's one way to do it. Then there's other fa factors. You can do activities, 
physical activities. I mean, the, the, the way that the Afia project, we sort of, uh, our pr approach to treating, uh, to, to sort of managing mental uh, well-being is, is a four-pronged approach. We look at it biologically, which is the uh, medicines and exercise and making sure that you're looking after your body, because yeah. remember, healthy body, healthy mind. And then the, the psychological, which is the, the talking therapy, making sure you have interventions, making sure you're, you know, you're, you're, you're looking at how you're reacting to things. Mm -hmm. The social, okay, this is where, you know, you, you look at your friend network, you look at, you know, um, uh, family, your sort of activities, etc. getting involved, because we're social beings in, in, yeah. in, this, in this world. So we, it's making sure that you're making sure you have that social network that helps you function. And of course, the last one is uh, if it applies to you, is spirituality. So this is where you take part in, you know, your prayers, etc. You recite your Quran, etc. Um, if you're, if that, if 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 you are that type of person, or mm. it's just introspection. It's when you look into yourself and you real and you think, okay, you ground yourself. So you, uh, um, how do I explain this? So when you ground yourself, you sort mm. of take a step back, sort of reposition. You think about, okay, fine. What's happening right now? Let me take a step back. Let me look at everything and then deal with it. That's one thing. Grounding, breathing mm -hmm. techniques, making sure you understand where you are, understanding purpose, living with purpose, etc. Looking into your life, thinking what has affected me, what hasn't, how can I change this? Introspection is part of the spirituality. So okay. in, when it comes to mental health, the treatment officially from a Western perspective is mm. medicinal and talking therapy. Mm. Uh, but there, is, there are up and coming things now. So the, the, the Royal College of Psychiatry is very much... Uh, promoting the use of spirituality and people's mm. faith in order to uh, improve their mental health and well-being. It sounds like outside the uh, spiritual aspect of religion, the equivalent would be something that I've been reading up on recently, mindfulness? Or, or... Yes. Okay. Yes. So mindfulness is a, it, it's a very secular version of, of what you would deem to be like worship. Mm -hmm. So it's whole concept of making sure that you're in the present and focusing on that moment in there and then. Mm -hmm. You have no uh, nothing else distracting you. So the whole concept is like, tell me one thing you can see, or, or, fight, or one thing you can hear, or two things you can hear, three things you can feel, four things you can, you know. It, it's about focusing on that moment in time upon something mm. and it allows you to ground and you think about yourself you think about okay, what is affecting me and it's about being conscious of your own state so you from mindfulness is very much a, it's over a secular version of, of what most people would deem to be like uh, spirituality or worship mm. if you may it's an interesting concept hearing uh, the secular development of uh, something that is uh, quite religious in its nature. And when it comes to uh, mental health well-being and, uh, and the, Muslim gener uh, the, the Muslim population in general, uh, do you see there is a disconnect or some sort of a misunderstanding of w what is mental health? Yes. I think um, in our society we're combating a few things. Mm. So when I first started working in mental health back in 2014, the issue was that we had to destigmatize it. Mm. And, and to destigmatize, uh, it means that it allows people to have a platform to talk about things and seek help when necessary. Mm. And alhamdulillah, we've done that. But let's talk about that for a little bit before we move on. Okay. Um, what is stigma? So, mm. stigma. Uh, is, is a term that was used in the past by the Greeks, which which referred to the branding. So mm. when somebody was uh, criminalized, like in, in certain aspects of ancient Greece, they would get like a hot brand, like a hot rod, and mark them, and that was the stigma. So people would know that that person mm. was or is a criminal. Oh, wow. Okay? Yeah. So to, yeah, to stigmatize somebody mm. is essentially you're saying, you know, you brand them as something so that so they're afraid to go seek help or talk about something, and as a result, it affects them negatively, and as a result, will affect everyone else. Mm. Remember, we we all work as communities, so uh, that was one of the biggest issues. And what would happen is that when you when you see something that you're not aware of, uh, like a condition like schizophrenia or paranoid schizophrenia, mm. people get scared because. They don't know what to expect. Mm. Whereas if you see something like diabetes or even a heart attack, at least you know what's going to happen. You know, it's scary, but at least you know what's going to happen. And when people don't know what's about to happen, that's when they start stigmatizing. So, 
when it comes to like uh, schizophrenia, yeah. we have some people in our community, in the Muslim community, they'll say one of two things. They'll say, firstly, mental illness does not exist. Mm. They'll be like, um, you know, it's it's a magic or gin issue or something like that, of of that level. And uh, I've yet to come across any mental illnesses caused by jinn possession, mm. if that makes sense. Okay? I mean, I understand, I, I'm not here to debate about the realities of magic and jinn possession. This is not what we're talking about. Mm. I'm just saying that I've never seen it personally. Okay? Um, that's one thing. People believe, they, they, categorically dis, they categorically say, no, there's no such thing as mental illness. It's magic and jinn possession. Mm. I think that's slowly dying out. But what's remaining, is uh, the people that say, okay, mental health illnesses do exist, but it's a it's a non-Muslim or a white person problem. Do you see what I mean? So we they just believe bury our that heads Muslims in the sands. may not. Mm. Be- so so we bury our heads in the sand and just ignore the issue altogether. Yes. Yeah, so they'll be like, it's, mm. they 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 believe that it's not possible for Muslims to become mentally unwell. Mm. That's what they genuinely believe, which, in my opinion, makes no sense. Um, I've seen. Countless of my patients are Muslims, practicing Muslims, good people, and I've had, I've 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 seen them become unwell. It's not it's not fair to say that, yeah. okay? And, and I think it's ignoring this, the reality. Now, those are the two current sort of states that we have mm. in terms of the the people on the opposite spectrum who are trying to say, you know, mental illness might not be real, etc. And, and the stigmatizing aspect. Mm. Now, I think we're all aware of that. But let's talk about the opposite side. Okay. Okay. So. We have people who will be like, let's all talk about our mental health, let's all talk about this, let's all talk, yeah. and, and I think to an extent that's great. It's good to know that people feel comfortable mm. to, to look, to realize that they're having any issues and talk about it. But what's happening now in society is that people will be talking about the issues, they'll unleash um, a lot of um, their, their, their trauma, but they, and the people that are listening to it will may benefit Mm. But I think that what's more important is that when people talk about their mental illnesses and their struggles, is that they should talk about the practical steps they took to overcoming said uh, said illnesses. Okay. Okay. And what's happening now is the op- is is mm. people are not talking about the practicality. So if you look on like social media, mm. for example, I think uh, last year the Afia project we uh, create we did a conference on Islam, mental health, and social media. Yeah. And one of the things we talked about is the whole concept of having uh, mental health champions. Mm. And what they do is they say, "Oh, hello, I am a mental health champion. I want people to talk about things." But then they don't actually understand mental illness properly, yeah. and uh, as a result, they cause more harm than good, uh, because uh, they facilitate talking about things without having the training necessary to be able to deal with anything that causes issues. Mm-hmm. And they don't actually have, they don't safeguard people. They just talk about, allow people to talk about it, and they think that's all. It's all fine. Yeah. And there are the, the issue with that is uh, these these mental health champions will then propagate more problems mm. because they'll slash open the belly of the beast, mm. which is in a way good, but they haven't had the necessary training needed or the understanding mm. needed to be able to deal with what's going to come out afterwards. Okay. Uh, uh, and, and, and they might not do it themselves or refer. Mm. This is the, the, these are the two sort of pathways you've gone into. Okay. You have the people that are anti-mental health related and they're overly pro. As Muslims, mm. we should stay in the middle, if okay. that makes sense. Okay, Jazakallah Khair for that summary of uh, the destigmatization of mental health and where it's just started to come uh, to it within the Muslim community. Uh, we're just going to go for a short break now, inshallah. Uh, join us after the break where we'll talk about, the, we will continue talking about the uh, m- uh, mental health issues within the Muslim community. We have with us Dr. Sultan Khatab. And before the break, we were just speaking about how uh, within the Muslim community in the last few years, there's been work to destigmatize, um, uh, destigmatize uh, mental health as it relates to Muslims. And uh, Dr. Sultan, when it comes to uh, mental health, um, we have a few different uh, issues. I think uh, when you mentioned depression earlier, 
uh, within the Muslim community. We also have, uh, though we may like to uh, ignore the issue, but there are Muslims who uh, are addicted to various things, and even uh, Muslims who have other uh, illnesses that are psychotic, and I use that word objectively speaking, not as it's mm -hmm. usually used, uh, thrown around. So if you can speak a little bit about um, these various different issues within the Muslim community and um, what sort of uh, work there has been uh, or, or help available for those people. Okay. Um, so, so when it comes to um, addictions, mm. let's, talk, let's, talk, let's talk about addictions first. Mm. Um, addiction is a very large terminology. Mm. In fact, to the point that you have uh, psychiatrists that are specialists in addictions. Mm. Now, addictions, are, we need to understand two things. An addiction is a mental illness. Mm. A dependence is a physical illness. Mm. So what I mean by that is, let's say any, let's say you have um, an, an, a dependence on a type of drug or something like that, okay, or, or something. What will happen is that, let's say alcohol. Let's use mm. alcohol. An, al an alcohol dependence is very common, very common. Um, and what will happen is that the body will expect a level of alcohol to be put into the body mm. okay uh, that's when you become that's when you become dependent and if you don't take the alcohol mm. uh, uh, your body will start to react and cause it to be very uncomfortable mm. um, and this is not a mental issue it's a physical problem your body will start reacting uh, there is a way to help the body sort of do that and it's alcohol detoxification we have a whole program for it Mm. It's very easy. It, it's done over a few days, mm. and uh, people can become removed from their dependence entirely. Mm. Okay. Now, the uh, the issue, the other one we're talking about is an addiction. The addiction here is a mental problem, where if the subs they believe that they they need to in in order for them to be okay, mm. they need that substance because then their brain doesn't function properly. Okay. Um, and, and this addiction is a pure mental illness, mm. um, um, but it's treatable. It's entirely treatable with the right, with, with you know, so long as the patient or the person in, in question is willing to actively work on it. So, um, what addictions do we tend to have? So, one I mentioned is alcohol problems. Mm. Then we have the illicit drugs and substances, and then we have the more the other one, which is like um, pornography and self stimulation. Uh, then you have food addictions, mm. um, and also issues with uh, like um, uh, you know, like how do I explain this? Just just general like work lifestyle. There's aspects of oh, life that they can yeah. become addicted to. Now this 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 is less common. What's common is more the substance stuff. Mm. Um, and what you find is that people that have um, substance abuse is that they face a lot of stigma. Mm. Um, and uh, as a result, they, they, they think that the only comfort they find in life is from it. Yeah. Now, initially, a person may use substances mm. um, to try and get the high, if you understand what I mean, mm. uh, to try and get to feel good. But over time, as you keep using it, mm. eventually, you will need it just to feel normal. Yeah. So if you don't take it, you'll feel mm. very low, which is why we have a massive problem in this country when it comes to drugs, because people mm. um, will sell whatever they can or, or you know, steal or mm. do stuff just to fund their habit, because if they don't, um, it will cause them to be very sick, Yeah. very, very sick. So addiction is a massive problem in our community. Mm. Um, I, th I think that's something that we need to be aware of, but mm. it's treatable. It's completely treatable, mm. so long as you help them help themselves. So remember, the person has, may have made a mistake, and they may have become addicted to something. But you know, at that point in time, they don't have the ability to fix it. They mm. need help, and that's where people come in. Yeah. So, uh, as you mentioned, it's it's a quite quite a large problem within uh, not just our community in general, but within the Muslim community as well. Um, what about the, um, the the word depression? It's always thrown around here and there. Um, do you see this as, uh, in, in your experience, uh, is this also a large problem within the Muslim community? And uh, what sort of help is there for those with uh, depression? 
Okay. So the first part of the question was, mm. um, is depression thrown around? Yes, it is. Mm. Uh, remember, depression back in the day was another term for sadness mm. or a high level of sadness. Mm. And what I and what the issue is is that people, like I mentioned previously, um, is that they don't understand that sadness is normal. Yeah. It's when it becomes a problem, like it's a chronic issue which you're not able to recover from for at least two weeks. So if you're constantly, all the time, I'm not saying like for a large portion of time, like all the time mm. that you're sad um, and it's lasted for at least two weeks, you're not enjoying anything anymore at all, and I can't remember the last time you enjoyed something and you're tired all the time, mm. and then that will give you indications as that maybe it might be mild depression. Because that's a physical problem. Because most people, let's be real, mm. may be sad for a bit, for a day or two, mm. or three, but then over time they'll start showing signs of function. That's not depression. So depression is, go is, is now a clinical illness. It's not yeah. just a word that you throw about. And it must only, must only mm. be described by a clinical professional, by a doctor, by a doctor, okay, yeah. as, a, as a diagnosis, mm. all right? It cannot be, cannot be described by anyone else. Mm. Now, to manage that, uh, the second part of the question is what, what, what help is available? Well, the first thing is that you need to recognize that there is an issue. Yeah. Most people that have depression, they don't have the, they're not able to recognize that there's a problem. Mm. So it may, just, it may be a relative or a friend or a neighbor that might notice these things and then just bring it to their attention. Mm. So what the, that's the first step of overcoming any issue is to recognize that there's a problem. Yeah. The next thing you got to do is that you need to uh, speak to your general practitioner, your GP. Mm. Go to your GP, explain what's happening, and then let them deal with it. If you can't do that, mm. there's a service on the internet called IAPT, okay, which is essentially A I A P T, which you can search, and each borough has their own specific service, which you can refer yourself. You don't need to go by a GP. You can refer yourself to mm. IAPT. And then they'll they'll see you and they'll be able to intervene that way. Uh, that's that's another thing you can do. Um, mm. Other things is that you can look at your four, you can look at your mental well-being and mm. work on that yourself. Remember mm. the four things we talked about: the biological, the psychological, the social, and the spiritual. Yeah. If you focus on all, on four or four and you work on each one, then it should make things a bit easier. But you still may need help. Mm. Um, I think most people they focus on maybe like one or two. Focus on all four. Now, um, other things you can do is you can go privately. Now, this is this is a bit conscientious. Sorry, conscious. It's controversial. Sorry, this okay. Thing. It's very controversial because um, many people. We have the NHS, and the NHS mm. is a fantastic, fantastic service. However, it's very stretched. Yeah. It's very stretched, and people that are, have mental illnesses may also have financial problems, and this is a reality. Mm. Um, so, if you're able to finance it. It's worth investing in your mental well-being. Uh, lots of people. We have gym memberships. We have phone contracts. We have, you know, uh, you know, memberships to like food organisations and all that stuff that we mm -hmm. invest our money in. But for some reason, we don't invest our money in our mental mental health and our physical well-being. Yeah. We may. That's why we have gym memberships, right? You do it so you can invest in yourself. Mm. So similarly. You should. I, I think that everyone should invest in their mental well-being. Mm. So if that means paying, uh, maybe like uh, 30, 30 pounds or however much for a session um, f with a with a specialist, or it can it can vary depending upon the, the experience and the qualification of the specialist. But it's it's worth investing in it. Mm. It may cost. It may. You know, I'm not saying it do do it every day. I'm saying maybe. Uh, you know, once a fortnight, once a month, you know, once, you know, whatever you need yeah. is worth investing in. Mm. Because otherwise, if your mental state is not at its, at its best state, you're not, going to, you're not going to be able to enjoy life. And the thing is, these people, they can guide you mm. towards overcoming your problems. You know, even, you might not even necessarily need to have a mental illness. I think every single person should have it. Because we all need help somewhere or another, and we may not, you know, our families and friends and support networks may not be the best people for us. It might be better just to have like a independent, third-party specialist professional that's able to know our problems confidentially, yeah. confidentially, which is a key phrase, and uh, they'll be able to advise us based on that. That's it. I think it's very important for us to do that. 
Okay. Jazakallah um, khair for the um, a, a good, good advice regarding mental health. Not only just invest in your mental health uh, when things go bad, but in, invest in mental health before things go bad. Uh, I think. Um, uh, uh, just just maintaining your well-being before uh, you know before before feeling ex uh, the extremities of uh, mental health uh, concerns and earlier on uh, and throughout the interview we've mentioned the afia project a few times um, yes. and now that you've explained what mental health is some of the concerns that we have uh, what does the afia project do for the community well, Afia Project is a 100% voluntary based mm. Islamic mental health organization. But our job mainly is to provide outreach education. So um, we go to mosques, community mm. centers, universities, and, uh, and circles and gatherings and organizations to, to deliver uh, uh, mental well being um, education mm. um, on a large scale. Now, obviously, since coronavirus hit, most of our stuff is being done via um, uh, uh, sort of devices and the internet, yeah. and it has been going down a bit because everyone's a bit affected by it. Mm. But alhamdulillah, we've we'll been doing a lot of work pertaining to that. So our, our role is to sort of um, is me specifically as an individual. Mm -hmm. My my uh, interest is male, uh, South Asian, uh, and um, uh, Muslim mental health. Yeah, that's my sort of specialty. We have other people in our team who are uh, who have other inter interests and their sort of backgrounds, and each one of our people they're vetted and we make sure that everyone's okay. But we do, um, at this moment in time we don't provide any sort of uh, uh, psychological support yet. Inshallah, once we get enough funding and stuff like that, and people come and offer us stuff, then it, we might we may be able to make it happen. But right now our focus is mainly psychoeducation, so we do a lot of that uh, mm. in group settings, etc. And it's just it's just teaching people because remember. Once you you know if if you want to do something about mental health, mm. you need to educate yourself about it. The yeah. more you learn, the more impact you can make, mm. and then facilitate, educate, facilitate. So so long as we can educate ourselves, I think that's that, that's probably our main aim mm. at this point in time. What are some of the surprising questions or queries that you received from uh, educating, whether, whether it's mosque leaders or uh, um, um, uh, sort of, uh, imams or uh, community leaders? What were some of the feedback that you found quite uh, interesting to see? Um, so we held a, we, 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 um, a few years ago, we held some training for mm -hmm. imams. Um, to sort of show them about the realities of mental illnesses. And what I find is that our um, imams and the people of knowledge, mm. they're very sincere, mm. mashallah. However, um, they may not have the, the, the skill set at that point in time to be able to deal with the, the sheer number of difficulties that come their way. You know, mm. you know a lot of people, they, the reason why we did the imam training was because a lot of people were coming to imams yeah. before they would go to their doctor. Mm. And uh, I understand that. You know, you trust this man. You know, you want their advice from the, from an experienced setting, mm. and you may not trust your doctor, which is I understand that. But they, they they themselves say, look, sometimes they come to me with with all these problems, and I don't know what to say. Mm. You know, and they're very overwhelmed, very overwhelmed. So what's important is 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 that you know the, the surprising things that people ask about is like. You know, what do I say when you know somebody says that they're having issues with their gender? What do I say when they have issues with using drugs and things like that and alcohol? What do I say when um, you know we have we have people that are are clearly mentally unwell but they're not seeking help? Um, how do I get people out of an abuse situation? You know, how how do I stop people from being harassed and having? Um, uh, the the the, uh, the trauma that has mm. arisen from maybe past sexual abuse, you know how how do we do all of that stuff? And it's it's not easy to um, to answer everyone's questions because it's just it just shows you if you speak to an imam that's very active in the community, they will tell you like the the number and the sheer amount of problems that people have mm. and uh, that are just uh, keep hit, kept hidden, okay, and not being dealt with, and they do their best, but it's only one person. You yeah. see what I mean? So it's 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 very difficult for for them, and for, what they want to know is, that why isn't there like structured mental mental health and sort of um, psychoeducation taught mm. being taught officially in the 
in, um, uh, in, in sort of Islamic education, and I think they are doing it now. I think Darul Ulum um, are doing it. I believe I believe the Egyptians in the Azhar are doing it. I'm not sure about uh, Saudi yet, but the, you know, officially they're slowly incorporating mm-hmm. mental health training into their sort of um, into their into their sort of education. Why? Yeah. Because if you're a leader of any community, you will need to deal with this. Mm. Be it your own house, or be it in the mosque, or be it in a school, or anywhere else. A leader will have to be able to deal with the people's mm. issues. Okay, mashallah. It sounds like um, the imams that you've helped uh, educate and train over the <coughs> last few years, they've, uh, they themselves uh, um, are having to deal with many great mental health concerns. And uh, Jazakallah khairan for facilitating their education in, in this field. And you also mentioned that the AFIA project it reaches out to uh, university uh, students and ISOCs, that's the Islamic societies yes. within universities. Um, what sort yeah. of uh, pressures um, or, or uh, emotional concerns do they uh, have? Well, a lot of the time, um, it's very rarely mental illnesses, as in in terms of the clinical perspective. Okay. Mm. Most people, they have their issues are social problems, so it's like. Uh, domestic abuse, it could be sexual abuse, it could be um, drug use, addictions, it could be your general stress about work, failing exams, mm. um, you know, gen- uh, deadlines, being overwhelmed with things, feeling that there's too, you know, imposter syndrome, s- stuff like that. It's, mm. it's, it's very much a range of things and I think, uh, I believe FOSIS are, are, are soon going to be providing um, welfare training for ISOC to be able to deal with certain issues that they're going to have. But I think that's in the works. We'll, we'll see in the future. Um, and we're working alongside them. We'll see how it goes. Uh, but in terms of ISOC works and stuff like that, I've mm. been dealing with, within the ISOC, we did a welfare training since welfare work as a team mm. since 2014. And so we've seen everything. Nothing can surprise me in terms of what I've seen. And I've seen some terrible circumstances. And it's very common because what, what often happens in years, as time passes, people pass away, right? So when, when you have to deal with students that have to deal with grief as well as their exams in university deadlines, etc., that's something that people need to take into account. Mm. So, uh, you know, some of the things that we've seen and some things that we have to, we have to train people with is very important. And, but the fundamental thing that every ISOC is missing is something called uh, uh, peer-to-peer development training. Mm. Uh, which is something that we, we give, okay? We train people how to do that. And, and that's how you're, you, have, you have the skill set necessary to deal with somebody who's very unwell at one point in time mm. or very over, over, you know, overwhelmed. Or do you know how to deal with certain situations that people come, come with? Um, and, and, and this is, people think often, yeah, all right, I'm, mm. I'm, I'm all right at this, I'm very good at this, etc. I don't, I don't need to worry. Most of the time, 99 mm. times out of 100, they're wrong. Mm. Off, most everyone requires a level of peer-to-peer sort of support mm. training, and most people don't understand that. And the stuff that the universities provide uh, may could be better. Mm. They're very good, but they could be better. And what we provide, alhamdulillah, is tailored towards Muslims okay. specifically. Jazakallah khairan for um, uh, for for the information, uh, for the training for uh, community leaders and students. It seems like uh, mental health. Uh, it's it's a hidden illness. Or, or, uh, and uh, it can be affected anyone from uh, a student that you see uh, to, uh, to the musalli that prays next to you or even yourself. And I just want to thank you, uh, Dr. Sultan, uh, for giving this interview, enlightening us on uh, mental health, uh, uh, mental health in general, and how it affects the Muslim community. Uh, and if you can just uh, give us a last few words maybe in how to uh, take care of ourselves as a summary. I know you've mentioned in the interview a few times, uh, but just as a last piece of, uh, of advice uh, before we close this interview. Absolutely. So very quickly, remember the four approaches to mental health, okay? Mm. It's uh, the biological, this is the physical stuff. This is where you, you need to make sure you're looking after your physical body. Mm. So if you need to take medications for your mental illness or physical, mental, physical illnesses, make sure you do that. Make sure you're going to the gym. Make sure you're eating well. You know, it's very important that you look after your body, okay? Because mm. um, then that will affect your mind. The psychological, this is where you invest in your mental well-being. You have to actively be able to reflect over what's working for you, getting therapy, talking therapy, talking things out, processing emotions, etc. Um, and then the social, this is your friends, your family, making sure you're around a healthy environment 
getting away from toxicity, making sure that you're being supported properly and utilizing that support of different things, be it work, having ambitions, studying, hobbies. This is very important. And then the last one, obviously, is, a, is the spirituality. This is where you know one should pray on time, making sure that they're doing things right, making sure that you're reciting Quran on a regular basis, etc., from a religious perspective, making sure that you're having time to reflect, be alone, connect mm. with God, connect to the highest power, making sure that you're able to benefit from it all. Uh, but obviously, if you're not as religious, you know that that's your prerogative. There's mm. other ways of introspection. Okay, or mindfulness, or whatever you may call it. Mm. All of this is essentially is very important that you deal with all four mm. at the set as, as much as you can, rather than one or two. Um, but yeah, as, as you know, if, if you ever need any support or what have you, or if you want advice on how to do things, or you want to see how things are done, just mm. follow us on the Instagram at Afia Project, at mm. Afia Project. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, etc. And just have a look. Uh, and see what we do. Uh, and I think Instagram is probably the best place to see all of our material, okay. and then maybe you can benefit from that, inshallah. Mm. Okay, Jazakallah Khair and Dr. Sultan Hatab for taking your time out um, uh, for today. And uh, you can uh, you can find us next week, inshallah, uh, on being Muslim with another uh, with uh, more uh, professionals and academics, inshallah. So please join us next week, uh, Saturday at 3 p.m. Uh, being Muslim on channel uh, on Ion TV, uh, Sky Channel 782.